food and sustenance for, for our neighbors in need. And then for many months afterwards, we were distributing food and clothing and healthcare and whatever from our parking lot and an adjacent building and a lot of other make do's that we had to do at that time. So, um, so it became very clear to me that preparedness for disasters is really critical. And so I'm looking forward to our speakers today who will be uh, speaking to that. My current role is as the executive director of the Community Foundation of the Valleys. And one of the things that we wanna be prepared to do is if there is a disaster in the Valley, earthquake, fires, mudslides, whatever, that we could really rally um, local community residents and businesses to contribute to support the Red Cross and other nonprofits that are out going to be out supporting people who've been impacted by uh, a major disaster. So at any rate, um, with that, I'm really pleased that our sponsor today is um, LA Department of Water and Power. And I have a little intro for our uh, board member, Keisha Williams, who, uh, Keisha Washington, excuse me, who's been a very active member of our board for a number of years. She's the Director of Innovation and Strategic Partnerships for LADWP. And uh, it's the, the largest municipal water and power utility in the nation. Um, so we'll hear a little bit more about that. And now I'd like to turn it over to Kanisha, to uh, Keisha. Welcome so, to our meeting and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. As she said, my name is Keisha Washington. Um, and yeah, the title this week is Director of Innovation and Strategic Partnerships. But seriously, my mission at the Department of Water and Power has really been to help unite communities, especially underserved communities, to take advantage of all the resources that we have. Similarly, the department has an obligation to serve all of our customers, and we're always looking for unique ways. Our base mission, of course, is the delivery of water and power services, but with that comes so much more. And it's ironic, I see Joanne on here, and I'm also a member of the Regional Red Cross Board, and I see Mr. Pope on as well, and I've been working with the Emergency Management Department. Given what happened with the earthquake and so many of the other challenges that we've had in the city, my mission as of late has been trying to figure out how do we set up places for our customers, our constituents, all of you to go when there is a, a power or water emergency as a result of a natural disaster, et cetera, where people can go and can feel safe, can have access to water, access to power. So look to hear more from us in the future. We're looking to partner with the emergency management department and other folks in the city to set up some, some facilities outside of the city norm, which is typically now you would go to a rec and parks facility or to a library. We're looking to do more and even better. And it's ironic with our partnership with the Red Cross, the last time we had done something here years ago, we started talking about how do we make sure businesses are ready before the big one happens? It's great afterwards, but the more that we can do to make sure that businesses especially, and again, that's my heart, know how to cut on their water, how to cut on their power, but more importantly, how to operate coming out of an emergency because small businesses are a lifeline. And if they can't operate, they can't keep people employed and it's a whole vicious cycle. So I'm very grateful to be here. I'm grateful to sponsor this and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Keisha. We, we appreciate your support in many ways. And uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and you know, one of the things we used to, when I was at MEND, we would do monthly drills where we would, one month it would be earthquake, the next month it would be fire and so on and so forth. But I know over time, um, some of the standards changed as to what you should be doing, you know, uh, if there is an earthquake, for example. So uh, again, I look forward to hearing from our speakers as to good strategies and how we can better prepare. We're gonna start today with Joanne Nolan, who is um, the CEO of the American Red Cross for the Los Angeles region. She's been in that role since uh, July, 2020. She oversees a team of staff and volunteers serving LA County and it's more than 10 million residents across five chapters. Joanne spent three years as the CEO of the American Red Cross in South Florida. And in that role, of course, um, led several major disaster responses, including Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Dorian and the Parkland shooting. So I, I'm sure that as the recent, you know, Hurricane Eon was going on, I'm, I'm sure that um, that uh, that uh, Joanne, you were thinking about your experiences living, having lived through that um, in Florida when you were there at that time. So anyway, we turn it over now to Joanne, and Great. thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you, thank you, Marianne. I'm going to state optimistically that 
I think this is probably one of the most important meetings we could have all week. What we're talking about, that preparedness, that reminder, and not only what us personally can do, but how we can share with others could, could be life-saving. So thank you. Thank you for finding time with, for on your schedule today. I am I'm so impressed with the work that this group has been doing inspired by the reality of what happened with the North Ridge earthquake. And uh, Marianne, you know, you talked about it, like these connections we have now help us after a disaster, that we already have those. Now we know each other. Hey, listen, this is what we need here because it takes a community. Um, so, and for the region of LA, I have an amazing board and Keisha, it is so good to see you. She is a leader on our board and she brings such value. So, so thank you for, for what you do for the board, Red Cross, and then our community as well. I have a PowerPoint. Some of this, I'm gonna go quickly because it's about preparedness, but I hope it will inspire you. So before I start, here's my one ask. Today, take something that you've learned from my remarks and tell someone else, right? Clearly the fact that you're here, you're interested in preparedness, you see the value, it's really how do we strengthen our entire community to be better prepared? So I'll tell you more about that. Um, I am gonna show a PowerPoint, and um, but so let me share my screen. Give me just a moment. So here is here's the reality. Um, disasters happen, and we never know. In fact, um, we say there's no such thing as a small disaster. And I'll give you an example. Um, every night, usually, usually at night the Red Cross sends a team of volunteers to a home fire every single night in LA County. Every night, one or more um, persons are, families are displaced from their home. They've lost everything. Um, so for that family, even though it usually does not make the news, it's a disaster for them. Um, so for us, we're, Red Cross is known for responding, but really the magic happens in these discussions around preparedness. So. Here's what we know. When a disaster happens, COVID, home fires, earthquake, um, a mass shooting, our normal response systems are overwhelmed. Um, and, you know, as, so we have, you know, just knowing that's going to happen. So what can we do to prepare? Here's an example. Jan, uh, June 30th, 2021, you may remember the South LA fireworks explosion. This was some illegal fireworks came in, uh, officials came in to remove them. Things went wrong, a massive explosion. So the first response of course, was all of those families. There were people who were injured, some seriously, homes were destroyed. But what you may not know, and cause I was on the scene is two blocks away from this explosion, it was a commercial road right next to it. All along that road, when the entire storefront's glass was blown out, I mean, the impact of this was extraordinary. But, so there's no access, there's no electricity, there's no gas. You could not get on the streets because there was ATF and fire and police there for days. So every single one of those businesses was immediately put into crisis and facing a disaster. So those are those disasters that you don't even think you might have to face. So it's like, how do we think bigger? Now we do know this, that as much as we wanna prepare our, our, our businesses, our organizations, our schools, we have to start at home. Because like each of us, if there's a disaster, the first thought that goes to is, is our, our own safety and our family. And how is our home? So if we can help educate ourselves, but also everyone we work with, all of our community members about how important it is to, to prepare at home. Um, now, here is the reality. We cannot, for a major disaster, a catastrophic earthquake, help is not gonna arrive right away. 
And, and similar to that, we talked about the, briefly the hurricane, right? There was at least a six day notice that a hurricane is gonna make landfall. The, the disasters in LA, that earthquake, everybody learns at once. Everybody finds out at once, right? So it's really important that we recognize that it could be a few days before help comes, if not longer. And so what can we do ahead of time? And here's the other, I think is an important piece of information. If we, each of us are more prepared and our families are a little bit more prepared, that means that when help does arrive, they can focus on those who don't have the capacity to get ready or the resources. Maybe that's your elderly neighbor. Maybe that's, you know, uh, we have single parents with a lot of kids or, you know, just those who don't have the resources to prepare. So you are helping everybody by us being prepared. Um, and here's, this. you know, you can prepare it, right? It is something we know that can happen. Um, will, it, will your preparedness be perfect? Nope. Um, will it make things easy? Not really but it will increase your chance and your family's chance and your coworkers and your team members that they will have, it will be, they'll be safer and they will have a, a better recovery from the disaster. Um, so we talk about Red Cross to be Red Cross ready. And it's really, it's three key things. Have a kit, make a plan and stay informed. So a kit. and now. I'm hoping people have kits. I know in a chat, maybe you can say whether you have your, your go kit. I have been impressed since I arrived in LA, how many people are aware of the need for a kit, right? That kit, for me, it includes water, a blanket, food, flashlight, a pocket knife, pet food, medicine, right? So there's, you really wanna make it, what do you need? What will you need to have ready? Um, and you want to maybe check it out every every year to see if it has the right uh, the right items in it. Make a plan. Um, so, um, so Marianne mentioned about Northridge, and it happened on Martin Luther King. It was a holiday, right? So there was there wasn't as many people out and about, um, and that is a better case scenario. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a county meeting with all the county leaders talking about a catastrophic earthquake. And one of the battalion chiefs from the fire department said, best case scenario, it happens in the middle of the night. Everyone's home for the most part, right? And we can take care of each other and your family. Worst case scenario is that an earthquake will happen middle of the week in the middle of the day. Everyone's out, kids are in school, working out and about, running chores. Um, and so a plan then becomes very important. How are you going to find each other? Where are you going to meet? Where are you going to go? Um, and so it's having these conversations now instead of later on. And then just staying informed. It, it's always find out how are you going to stay informed? Red Cross has some really great apps, free, no ads. So um, I'll, I'll make sure I put a link in that to some of our apps so that you can stay um, informed. And this is information, you may know this, make sure you're talking to others. Um, our biggest threats here, earthquakes and home fires. That's what we talk about a lot, right? Um, so what time is it? It is 1020, perfect timing. Today is a great shakeout. So the great shakeout is when we're asking everybody in California to do three things. If there were an earthquake, and so we're all. Oh, and I did, I'm getting a test. Did anybody get this on their app uh, about a um, test of an earthquake? So here's, right, everyone's hopefully getting this. Um, so this is a scenario. Step number one, drop. Drop to your, uh, get down your hands and your knees. You wanna get low. Two. Cover your head, right? Cover your neck and head. Grab your pet if you have it. And if you can, get under a desk or a table and hold on. If you can't get under a desk and table, then find something else. So Marianne, I'm gonna take a moment. 
Should we ask everyone to do this exercise? I, I don't know, since we have three speakers today, I'm not sure if we have the time to do that, um, okay. where people so. are sitting. I mean, in my case, I could go under my desk, but maybe- All right, it looks like, car, Richard, so. were you doing it? <laughs> okay, right, you get down, hang on. Um, I have to role model. Yeah, okay, thank you, Richard, for being a role model. Um, and the reason, you know, like, you want to get low, you don't want to move, right? There's going to be glass, things are shaking, and you want to hold this position until things stop shaking. Um, so that is part of the great shakeout. Um, and just a reminder, after the earthquake, let your loved ones know that you're safe. I had the, the board chair for the Red Cross here in Los Angeles, mother was in Sanibel Island decided to stay in her home. He did not, he could not get a hold of her for four days, not knowing what had happened. So as soon as you can, let your family here or in another state know that you're safe. So, um, okay. And the other is home fire. We don't talk about it. You don't hear it in the news that much. Every single night, there are multiple home fires. And so for us, it's encouraging folks to, to be safe, right? Red Cross does something where we, every weekend, like this weekend we'll be in Montebello, installing free smoke alarms and then educating those families. Almost every time we've gone into these homes to, to install smoke alarms, we've seen a lot of plugs plugged into a lot, another plug plugged into another plug. And then sometimes there are rugs on top of it. Those are some hazards that we need to create awareness that that's not safe um, and finding other ways to do that. Um, so smoke alarms save lives. I, I think we all know that, right? Uh, the good news is smoke alarms have improved over the last 10 years. We now have batteries that last 10 years. Uh, they're not, uh, they're more sensitive to, um, to not going off just because the, the shower steam. Um, so, so the good news is taking away some of the annoyances um, because we know they save lives. Okay, so this is real. I want to spend a few minutes talking about this. This is a program the Red Cross has called Ready Rating, completely free. It's specifically focused on mid and small sized businesses, schools, organizations um, who may not have an entire department that can create an a, um, a emergency action plan. And I have been so impressed with with this program, and I wanted to share a little bit more about that. Um, let me get my notes. So this is was designed because we knew that, we know that the recovery of a community after disaster is complete correlated with the recovery of the local economy. Keisha mentioned this. We need our communities back. We need businesses back. We need, we need supplies. We need things, stores to open. People need to go back to work. They need to earn money because it can create a spiral of quickly going downhill. So for us, here's an example. So we have a massive response happening in Southwest Florida with Hurricane Ian. Red Cross focuses as much of their buying power in that area, right? We need to generate some income um, for these businesses. So your, it's not just your own income for you as if you own a business or work in a company, but it really is about the recovery of our community. So ready rating, and this is you know what we talk about. Um, we saw it all firsthand with COVID, the devastating effect it had, not only on individuals, but also on businesses. I mean, how many of your favorite stores aren't there anymore? So accident, you know, disasters do happen and they come in so many different forms. Um, so here is where, how do we, and I, so here's a couple questions to, to ask. So during a disaster, are you confident that your organization can protect the lives of everyone at your facility? Disaster could be, you know, it's, it's, there's all kinds of disasters. Another question, is your organization prepared to ha handle a prolonged power outage? So those are two questions to think about that, you know, a lot of people will be like, I don't know, I can't guarantee that. 
And so that's the reason why taking this ready rating. So I want to tell you a little bit about what ready, ready rating is. Um, this is a, it's a website free called readyrating.org. I'll put the link in the, in my chat as well as at the end. And it walks you through, you answer a few questions, does an assessment. It helps provide you with all of these scenarios that could happen and how you can respond and what you can do ahead of time. It actually will create a customized report. So if you enter that, you know, one area you don't really have, maybe an emergency action plan, it will lead you to a module that will help you create it, giving you templates, everything you could need to prepare your business, your, your organization or your school. Um, and again, it's free. And the reason I keep saying that, this is not, this is part of the mission of the Red Cross. Our, you know, our mission is to alleviate human suffering. We know an ill-prepared individual, family or community suffers greatly from a disaster. So we wanna help with that. Um, this is a, the Ready Rating website is constantly updated with the newest information. Marianne Enchin, right? It's, things change, we learn, we think, you know what, actually this is a better way to, to manage this. Um, so here's, here's my request for you to, to look at, join, go on to Ready Rating, encourage your friends. If they have other businesses, um, there is an assessment Here's my one warning. And what I've realized with some feedback is for some folks, it can be overwhelming, right? You've got enough going on and then it can give you a list of things like you need to work on. Um, focus on five of them. Just say, okay, what are the five I'm going to focus on today? What are some, the five things I can do to just improve my preparedness, right? We're not in a disaster. We have the luxury of time right now talked about it. Make sure, you know, the management knows, or if you're the owner, make sure your team knows this is something important. This is something we want to make sure we're talking about and investing, um, get their input of how, of what are some, some steps we could take now to be prepared for any type of disaster. Um, and then continue to go, um, I'm looking at it. So this is these are some sort of ideas, sort of like, what do we do with this? Um, but if my, my, my request with you today is if you can be a little bit more prepared and you can help a few others be a little bit more prepared, our community as a whole is going to weather this better, any disaster. Because does that, right? We know now, we know disasters happen all the time. Some are small, but they're still a disaster. Pandemic, mass shootings, um, and of course, earthquakes and, and um, natural disasters and such as wildfires. So they do happen. Um, and I think the more we face them and say, all right, what are we gonna do today to be more prepared is, is a gift to yourself and, and to our community. So these are- Okay. This is redcross.org, LA, uh, readyrating.org. That is, it. it's our Red Cross website, but go, you can go there. Um, and then this is my contact information. And I'll also put this in the chat so you have that. So, um, and I'm gonna end there. So uh, Marianne, I'll, I'll back to you. All right, well, thank you. That is perfect timing. My watch says 10.30. And that's exactly on schedule for us. So thank you so much. Very interesting, Joanne. Thank you for these good resources, additional information that we can follow up on. Um, and we will have some discussion after our three presenters. We'll, we'll go ahead and have some discussion. So if you have questions, hold them. I'm assuming Joanne will continue staying with us through the rest of the meeting. And then uh, we'll, we'll discuss those uh, in a little bit. So I'm now very pleased to introduce Louis Saad. Is it Saad or Sad? It's Sad. It's like I'm happy. Okay. Great. All right. Um, thank you for joining us today. And we're kind of switching to a different topic, but very relevant um, cybersecurity, especially many of us heard about the 
big debacle with the LA Unified School District, and certainly there are many other companies uh, and institutions that have been involved as well. So Louis is the founder and CEO of Datastream IT, a Glendale-based company that provides a broad range of IT services to a wide range of industries, including financial services, engineering, entertainment, manufacturing, real estate development, and nonprofit. Louis was born and raised in Glendale and attended Glendale Public Schools before graduating from USC, go Trojans, with a BS in accounting information systems. And we do like our UCLA friends and others that are with us, but got to be a good Trojan fan. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, Louis, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from you now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, I'm going to start my presentation now. And it was really good hearing from Joanne too and with respect to how we can protect ourselves and our families and our organizations and ultimately our communities from uh, natural disasters and disasters that could, could take place for a number of different reasons. Um, I wanna start by discussing as we get into cybersecurity without getting into too much technical detail, our IT operational efficiency and then how that compares and contrasts with uh, cybersecurity. So, IT operational efficiency, you know, as organizations, we become efficient by the people that we have on board, by the processes and procedures that we have on board, of course. And as we all know, over the last few decades, technology has played a huge role in making our organizations more efficient. You know, we're, right now we're, we're all together on Zoom. You know, that, this is something that years ago would not, would not be possible for everyone just to have a camera ready, to be able to connect on Zoom and and meet like we're in the same room. Um, there's so many different ways that all of our nonprofits and uh, for-profit organizations have, have been better with the use of technology. But with the use of technology being injected in our organizations, there's more risk, uh, of course, right? And, and cyber threats are huge, cyber threats. We're gonna discuss how they've hit some organizations, including LA Unified School District. Um, but let's talk about operational efficiency for just a minute here. Uh, so. I like to think of COVID-19, it, it was a tragedy, it was terrible, it, it hit the world, we had no idea what was coming and it, it unraveled in different ways for different countries and organizations in different parts of our country. Um, but we saw 10 years of transformation happen in two months. And what I mean by that is, we all began working from home overnight. Remember all that with the lockdown orders in California, we immediately started working from home. Organizations were absolutely not prepared for that, many of them. And then all, all of a sudden we saw this, Thing that we thought was going to happen over the next decade oh work from home half our workforce or all the workforce or we're going to use technology in different ways that, that we could all of a sudden that just happened overnight and within two months organizations were completely remote or, or vastly uh remote in many ways and in, in hybrid scenarios so we saw that push um what we call work from home has kind of become the norm i mean right now we're we're all uh many of us are working from home uh so that became the norm and what we recommend organizations do is touch base frequently with your teams on how this is working. And we're gonna get into how that uh, impacts us with the cybersecurity focus. But at the bottom of your screen there, you can see technologies that organizations are leveraging, remote desktops, laptops and docking stations, cloud solutions like Amazon, AWS and Azure, uh, Office 365, Teams, Slack and Zoom. We're using Zoom right now to meet and many different uh, phone systems that, that companies are using to work more efficiently. But with this becomes a huge cybersecurity risk. And small and medium-sized businesses are an ideal target and COVID-19 made it worse. Um, how did it make it worse? Well, teams rushed to work from home with cobbled together hardware and it's still the case, right? Even though we're several years into COVID-19 uh, and you know we're, we're mostly out of the woods, we're still in this uh, situation of working from home with hardware that your IT department threw together and planning is not you know fully caught up and so forth. Um, teams are not trained in the security aspect. People are letting their guards down and screen locks and multi-factor authentication aren't being used as much as they could because people have this false sense of security working at home. Um, ha hackers absolutely will capitalize on this um, when it comes to COVID-19 topics, which is mostly fading away, but government messaging and that evolving scenario, government, 
hackers are capitalizing on this because they know people are checking their inbox and expecting search, certain messaging from either the Red Cross or their local city government or their county or the state or federal government. So we're still in the wake of COVID-19, even though it's mostly uh, largely over. So we were talking about LA Unified School District. I like to look at this and I should add LA Unified School District to this list now because this, this slide that I have here needs to be updated about every week, unfortunately. But you look up here and you see high profile organizations like Target, Home Depot, Apple, Walmart, um, Marriott, Deloitte, which is the largest accounting firm in the world, Yahoo, the White House, the uh, DNC. Who can forget Sony? You know, Sony, this massive organization, Sony Pictures, was the victim of a cyber attack. And Equifax, I really uh, get frustrated thinking of Equifax because it's an organization that all of us, quote unquote, do business with, but none of us signed up to do business with Equ Equifax. They have all of our sensitive information. And there was a breach, as we all remember, which impacted over 143 million Americans. They have all of our social security numbers, all of our uh, date of births, all, all the credit cards that we're signed up with, and they were breached. Again, very frustrating because none of us signed up to do business with them. But when we look at these organizations, worldwide known organization, and they were attacked by hackers and cybersecurity breaches. We can't help but think that those of us who are individuals, parts of different uh, organizations within our community, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, small nonprofits, medium-sized nonprofits, we have to be on our guard because when the, the big organizations like this get hacked, we have to be mindful of the fact that as small and medium-sized organizations, we don't have all the tools that these big organizations do, and they still were breached. They have millions of dollars specifically dedicated to cybersecurity. So what hope do we have? Well, it starts with being mindful of the situation. Here's the big picture. Hackers take over a trillion dollars annually. 43% of cyber attacks target small and medium-sized businesses. Why? Because they don't have that infrastructure in place and they're not training their teams as much as the larger ones. And the larger ones still get breached as we discussed. 95% of cybersecurity breaches are due to human error. Remember the Target Target retail stores? Remember the Sony picture breaches? Both of those were due to human error. It wasn't some technical thing that was uh, uh, breached by a hacker. It was hackers manipulating individuals with the, within the organizations uh, and, and LAUSD to a large extent was the same thing. Most hackers take, uh, most companies take nearly six months to detect a data breach. And that's the really scary thing. So in other words, hackers can be having their claws in your organization as we speak right now. And it would take up to six months for organizations to, to detect that. Why? Because when, when hackers get into an organization, they don't necessarily want to alert the media that they're there, right? They want to see the habits and procedures and they want to get all the data that they can. I mean, it's like someone robbing your house and being invisible and being able to float around your house. They don't wanna uh, tip you off to be able to detect them. More than 77% of small businesses believe their companies are safe and that's a scary statistic. 30% of all cyber attacks hit small businesses with 200 or fewer employees. 200 or fewer employees, that represents the vast majority of companies and nonprofits in the San Fernando Valley. It, it was mentioned earlier, the San Fernando Valley, Valley is a huge business hub nationally and actually worldwide as well. Uh, and if it were one city, it would be one of the largest cities in America. Cyber attacks affecting smaller firms don't make the news because they won't issue a press release. In other words, if a law firm, if a CPA firm, if a nonprofit, if a small business, if a medium-sized business is the target of a cyber attack, they're not going to call the San Fernando Valley Business Journal. They're not going to call the LA Times. They're not going to call the local organizations and let everyone know that this happened, right? So if you're a law firm, if you're a CPA firm, if you're a company based in the Valley, if you're a nonprofit based in the Valley, there's organizations similar to you that have gotten hacked. And you might hear about it at a cocktail party or something, hush, hush, but everyone's embarrassed of this executive leaders are embarrassed of this, that how could this happen to us? So we will hear about the LA Unified School Districts, but we're not going to hear about that small and medium-sized business or nonprofit that flo floated under the radar. So we, because we don't hear about it, we kind of have this false sense of security that we're not at risk. So when it comes to cyber threats and breaches, these are the words that come to mind, right? 
security, operating systems, data access, hardware, software, coding, networks, right? So this is all, these are all the worlds that we think of when it comes to cyber attacks. But wh where does attack really happen? How can we really prevent it? The re reality is it's a people thing. And you could see the two sides of the lock here. On the right, you have your IT team. On the left, you have your leadership team. Both of these teams need to be in sync for you to be prepared as much as possible for a cyber breach. In other words, you can't just throw this to your IT team and say, oh, you know, IT is aware of it. They have all the software on our computers. They have all the systems. They update it. We're paying for all the latest and greatest stuff. You know, let's have a great day. That's it. No, absolutely. The leadership team, meaning the CEOs, the COOs, the HR leadership for nonprofits and companies alike need to be on the same page. This needs to be something that's at the forefront of their mind, not something that they just throw over to IT over the fence and say, okay, they're, they're handling it. We're good. Thumbs up. So this is a, it's a two-way street. So I, I always want to show this model because there's a lot of discuss about the dark web and what that is. Um, so what is the dark web? Well, let's start by discussing what the surface web is. The surface web is like uh, the top of an iceberg, what we can see. So if we Google someone's name and a colleague, if we Google an organization, anything that comes up in a Google search is on the surface web, meaning it's publicly available to search on Google or Yahoo uh, or any search en engine that we use, right? The deep web is things that are not publicly available on Google. And the deep web can comprise of like government websites, it's like the FBI has certain IP addresses and, and certain websites that are only accessible to FBI agents, right? It's not something that we can just search. Um, so those are things that are anything below the surface of the water in this example are part of the deep web. Well, part of the deep web, really deep within the deep web is what's called the dark web. Uh, and the dark web is where nefarious and, and malicious activity takes place. Uh, it is not available in this Google search, but what it is is it's hackers and other groups working together to buy and sell information. So for example, credit card information, passwords, you know, if we, if I'm a member of target.com or amazon.com and let's say target.com gets hacked, well, guess what? The password that I put in for target.com is now available on the dark web because someone's selling it for, you know, 50 cents a piece to someone who wants to pick that up. Take, take a look at Louis and say, oh, Louis' Gmail address. This is Louis' password used on Target. I wonder if that same password used on Target, he also used on homedepot.com. And that's how, that's how hacks happen. That's how breaches can occur. So um, having different passwords for everything, that's the reason why. Because it's only a matter of time because before Home Depot or Amazon or LinkedIn or any of these organizations get breached, whatever password you're using can be found out. And therefore, if you use it on another website, that's how hackers can, you know, put the chain together and, and breach information from you. So as I discussed before, organizational cybersecurity policies are huge. It, it takes your leadership team and your IT team working together. Everything starts with leadership. The C-suite, meaning the CEOs, COOs, HR need to be on board. Um, introducing a cybersecurity policy it is huge. And what I recommend is integrating this into your HR policies for your organization. And they can't just be like your actual HR policies. They can't just be something that sits in a piece of paper and never looked at. They should be understood by everyone from the CEO to the most recent hire in your organization. They should understand that security policy as it pertains to HR. Um, I recommend discussing cyber threats at team meetings. I know it's a topic we, it's not that exciting. And it's something that we like to avoid talking about. But I recommend when you have team meetings, whether they're monthly meetings, quarterly meetings, whatever they may be, I recommend discussing the potential of a cyber threat and how that would impact your organization. Um, ongoing training is also key. So there's, uh, we provide our clients with different options for being able to uh, go through training uh, videos and so forth and little exams to make sure that your team, team is on top of that. Um, and simulated phishing attacks. We all heard, have heard of a phishing email, like, you know, Louie, you won $25 to Domino's Pizza, click here to retrieve it. Um, then you click it, then you put in your information, you put in your credit card, and then whoops, that was a fake email. That's called a phishing email or a phishing attack. Uh, and what we can do for our clients if they'd like is we 
set up phishing attacks that are simulated. So we do fake emails like that. And if any of your employees click it, we just kind of say, gotcha. Keep in mind, this was a simulation, but this could be the real thing. So we need to be careful. Um, business continuity planning is really huge. And when Joanne was speaking about the Northridge earthquake, this, this came to mind. Um, business, so business continuity planning consists of a disaster recovery portion and then a business continuity portion. But the disaster recovery or DR plan is restoring data and IT infrastructure. So Joanne was asking as it pertains to earthquakes, would your organization be okay without electricity? Well, we also have to think about would our organization be okay for X amount of hours or X amount of days without access to the internet, without access to our data, you know, especially organizations like uh, nonprofits that deal with the homeless or nonprofits that deal with um, individuals who are at risk in different ways. Can you be okay without internet? Can you be okay without monitoring? Is there safety concerns, you know? Uh, the security cameras and so forth. What is your contingency plan on that? So the disaster recovery portion would deal with restoring the data and IT infrastructure. What, what, just think of if the Northridge earthquake happened today and internet was down for days or weeks, how would our businesses be impacted? And then the business continuity plan uh, is keeping the business operational after a disaster or incident. So when preparing these plans, uh, we recommend to be specific about the who, what, where, when, why. So for example, if someone tragically is lost during the next Northridge quake, and that individual happens to be the COO of an organization or the director of HR or the facilities manager. I mean, let's just, the worst case scenario, they, they pass away in that incident. What's next? The facilities manager passed away. What do you do now? Who, who acts instead of that, facilities manager? Do they have all the data that they need? Do they have the passwords? Do they have access to what they need? If there's a safety concern, if it's a hospital, for example, and the facilities manager is gone, who's going to act on their behalf? That needs to happen within minutes or hours when you're thinking of an organization like a hospital and even for-profit companies, right? Things need to be moving along um, for you to stay in business. Testing it annually or uh, recommended quarterly is something that we also recommend. Um, so think of these you know, I, I think the Northridge example, which is the, the foundation of uh, the Valley Economic Alliance is a good example, because think of if that were to happen today, how we would move forward from this point. So um, IT security, I'm just gonna go through this briefly and I'd be happy to, to speak about this later, but having the right tools in place, whether they be VPNs, antivirus, spam blocking, when it comes to security, make sure that your IT team is managing this. Security patching. Microsoft and all the big players in the space are continually being breached in different ways. And therefore, Microsoft and all these big players will release security patches to combat those breaches. So there's little, think of little holes in the system. They create patches like that Band-Aid on the right to, to mitigate those breaches. Well, you, you need to make sure that your IT team is putting those patches in place when it matters. Establishing backups, regular backups, make sure they're scheduled. Make sure they're automated, make sure they're offsite, and make sure they're being verified by your IT team. The worst thing is in the world is a backup that is running. And then for six months or a year, it actually wasn't back being backed up because your IT team wasn't verifying it. And then you need it. And then whoops, that data was never backed up. Lock down, lock down your network ports, eliminate open ports on your routers. And again, your IT team should be aware of this, but make sure they're reporting to you on this when it matters. Um, and then when it comes to IT security, Multi-factor authentication. Um, so multi-factor authentication, just as we close up here, what that is, I think we've all seen that when you get a text message or when you're able to put in a code when accessing website, right? So if you're running payroll, um, payroll is obviously a very critical system where there's a lot of sensitive information in there. If you have your HR person log logging into the payroll system, can they just log in with the password or do they need multi-factor authentication? Meaning they have to have something they have, which is their phone with a code and something they, they know, which is a password. Um, so it's critical to have that. And just a quick note, we do not recommend SMS or text messages. Long story short, those are easy to spoof or breach. Um, they're easy to replicate. So we recommend something like Google Authenticator or Duo, which is that code that changes every 30 seconds. We re recommend that strongly as opposed to a text message. 
using password managers like LastPass or OnePassword are recommended so that you can have those unique passwords for every single thing. The worst thing is uh, when it comes to passwords is having the same password for everything. You want to have it completely random and unique. Having a password manager that's also secured and multi-factor uh, authentication secured is, is going to be the key to that. And finally, on the side, leveraging the cloud, you know, utilizing software as a service platforms, uh, leveraging the cloud as opposed to running servers in-house whenever possible, unless you have an IT team managing those servers. Um, and even then, it's something that over time, when budget allows, moving to the cloud is, is what you want to do. So that's it when it comes to cybersecurity. And thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Louie. This is terrific. And again, you are right on time. Thank you so much. A great presentation. I took some notes and realized I need to, well, the Community Foundation is a pretty small operation. I need to talk to our IT guy and ask a few questions now. And I'm glad you brought those to our attention. So mm -hmm. I assume that um, Erica or somebody from the uh, Economic Alliance team will be sending out your PowerPoints and the one from the Red Cross and so on later so that we can refer to those as needed. So uh, thank you again for, for joining us today and for your uh, valuable uh, information. So our last but not certainly not least uh, speaker is Rick Pope. Um, he serves as an emergency management coordinator in the city of Los Angeles. He works in the community preparedness and engagement division of the city's emergency management department. He is recognized as an emergency management specialized by the California Office of Emergency Services and has served as a run, hide, fight trainer and a search and rescue specialist, a military emergency management specialist, and a combat medic with the United States Army. Thank you for your service. So, Rick, why don't you take it away? Well, let's see if I can get the technology squared away. Uh, Joanne and Louie were difficult to, uh, they're, they're <laughs> really tough to follow. I, I am not the most uh, polished of presenters like them. Uh, I was a field guy for quite some time uh, and it shows. Um, one of the things that I wanna say before we begin is when I talk about individuals in this presentation, I would also like you to think about corporations, nonprofits, your businesses. Um, uh, so when we incorporate a business, it, we create a body, if you will. And that's what we're talking about is the individuals who run these corporations um, and the individuals themselves. I would also like to emphasize the work of nonprofits because typically, um, in the world of nonprofits, the work of the many often rests on the shoulders of the few. Um, I grew up in the deaf community. Uh, I was a sign language interpreter. Um, I was with the Department on Disability up until this past April. Um, you might even have recognized me as being the mayor's sign language interpreter guy during the COVID uh, crisis. So the issue of nonprofits is very close uh, to me. And even um, as a result of the hurricane of Hurricane Ike hitting Texas, I think it was out of the Texas Department of Public Health, they spell out very clearly that the stability and the return of the population and the economy rests heavily on the return of nonprofits and human services organizations. Because without them, the rest of the people don't come back. So. Uh, Keep in mind the importance of nonprofits, please, as we go through this. All right, without further ado, who's in Los Angeles? We're talking 4 million residents overnight. They say 6 million during the day. I've heard numbers as high as 10 million. With 471 square miles, just under 9, 000, uh, 10 thousand police officers, and uh, a little over 3,200 firefighters. What does that mean for us? Well, what it means is, is that government's not going to be there. And, and uh, I remember the Northridge earthquake, even though I was in the land of blizzards out in Boston, because having grown up in the deaf community, you might know that there's a large deaf community in Northridge. And believe me when I tell you, when that earthquake hit, the ripple effect across the nation in that community was uh, enormous and highly disruptive. So how to mitigate this? 
make a plan. And in your businesses and homes, identify the hazards, like what cases that'll fall down and secure them. Create the plan. What are you going to do when it's one o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon and it hits? What are your supplies? They're talking about a week of food and water, one gallon of water per person per day. Minimize financial hardship. Make sure that your documents are on, a cl on the cloud or uh, somewhere else, and we'll, we'll get into that later. However, I do want to emphasize what you see uh, in the blue there, ready.gov slash make a plan. Go there, make the plan, and you've, you've heard why. The business continuity plan. And this is really where, again, I'll, I'll emphasize uh, nonprofits and human services, uh, human service organizations. What's going to happen when everything shake, rattles and rolls and catches on fire? How are you going to continue operating? And in the case of nonprofits, uh, how do we serve our mutual constituents? Because your constituents will certainly be mine. So you need to understand what kind of emergencies or threats uh, would affect your organization. Go to LA Emergencies and Threats, and uh, if you can Google that, then there's a tool that'll help you figure out what threats you're facing based on your location. Create a crisis communication plan. So how are you going to be in touch with employees, customers, clients, okay? Um, Will you need to be in touch with them? How much of these people are actually going to uh, will be depending on them? And here's the weakest piece, I think, for a lot of organizations that really mean well, if you will. They don't practice the plan or, or drill it or exercise it because to do that is to take time out of the day. Um, and again, in the, in the case of uh, nonprofits, it's difficult to do that when you're running on grant funding. Um, but if you don't practice it, then you know what's going to happen once it hits. You will revert to the lowest level of your training, which quite often is none. So having a plan is great, but if you don't actually work it, it's not going to mean much. Review your business insurance policy. We keep on hearing about, in the case of uh, the Southeast, flood insurance, or here, earthquake insurance. Make sure that your coverage is adequate. And uh, to piggyback on the last conversation, take steps to protect your data and information from cyber attacks. More information, go to FEMA's Ready Business page. So for employees and the organization at large, make sure that your plan is discussed out there in the open. Make sure that people know what uh, they need to be doing. Build that supply kit. And I'm going to emphasize this one with specialized items unique to your family or employees. Um, having come from the world of folks with disabilities, you can imagine a lot of the conversations that uh, we've had. Um, so uh, make sure your medications are squared away, batteries, chargers. Okay. Try to make it as comfortable for you as possible uh, when it hits. Uh, also, the same for those of us who have pets. Um, other furry family members. Go around your home or your facilities to do a, a hazard pump, like uh, water heaters that haven't been strapped in. Learn how to shut off the gas and water. And what you'll see there is a wrench made out of beryllium. It's a non-ferrous, meaning that there's no iron in it to create a spark. Make sure you've got one to shut off the gas. Only shut off the gas though, if you smell that rotten egg, uh, smell, you hear it hissing or you see it hissing. Uh, the reason we say that is that if you don't need to shut it off and you do, it's going to be a long time before you get it back on. Uh, learn first aid and CPR and um, check out your community emergency response team. That tends to be run through the fire department and they will help you with first aid, CPR, light search and rescue, cribbing. These are the folks in the neighborhood who um, actually have been trained and have a plan prior to get together and help stabilize their neighborhoods. We know that, uh, especially from earthquakes, say in Mexico City, that 
the majority of the rescues were from people just passing civilians. No training, no nothing. Uh, but remember that CERT came out of the Northridge earthquake. There is a purpose to it. And uh, the more that we can get folks on the ground stabilized, the more we can get the entire city stabilized. So we talked about a disaster supply checklist. I won't go through uh, every single thing that's on the lists here, but I will emphasize food and water for a week one gallon per person per day. So if you're talking about your typical family of four, you're talking about 28 gallons of water and food. We understand, we in the emergency management community, understand that's kind of a heavy lift. Um, so consider building it up slowly over time. Uh, make sure they have your, medi your medications and a list of when you need to take them. Um, sometimes it's a, a, a difficult thing to get a, a good amount of medications built up. So the little trick is, is that you tend to have like a week overlap between the uh, old bottle of medi uh, medication and the refill. Take that week, put it aside, build it up and put it in your cash. Folks with disabilities, um, like I've said, adaptive and supportive equipment to use, instructions on how to use it, because if you end up in a shelter, and you need folks to help you use it, uh, like a hospital bed or something like that, then uh, it would it would uh, help quite a bit. Maybe a hospital bed isn't too realistic, but power chairs, for example. And then of course, for kids, uh, keep them fed, keep them happy. And that familiar toy or book um, is really important, just so in the middle of chaos, they have something familiar, um, maybe stuffed animals. And that car seat, even if your kid's uh, growing out of it, it, it again, is something um, uh, familiar and is portable. So uh, you can put it in whatever vehicle may be evacuating you if necessary. First aid kit, bandages, gauze, wipes, rubber gloves, and masks nowadays. Don't forget that COVID is going to be endemic. So we're still dealing with it. Take your documents and financial information and put it somewhere, especially businesses, your articles of incorporation, right? Put it on the cloud, send uh, things to an out-of-state contact. The biggest problem that we find uh, post-incident is that people will say, hey, I own this property that's you know since burned down. And uh, so I need to talk to the insurance folks. And the first thing they're going to ask is, well, let's see the paperwork that proves you, you own it. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, that just burnt up in the fire. So small problem and things end up getting delayed and drawn out. Um, and just, uh, I've been with the city for uh, nine and a half years. And it's only, I think, about five years ago that FEMA and emergency management in general kind of closed the books on the Northridge earthquake. That's how long this stuff can take. Um, don't forget to uh, take care of your pets, right? They're going to need food and water. One thing I will uh, emphasize on the issue of cash is make it small bills. The reason being is that when the power goes out and you want to buy, say, a gallon of milk, and you only have a 20 and he can't make change, guess what? That gallon of milk just costs you 20 bucks. So again, ready.gov slash kit. And because in a worst case scenario, it'll hit at one o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday, be prepared for it. Have a blanket, food, water in your car. Um, and if you're on public transportation, make sure you're familiar with the emergency procedures are. And if you use paratransit, talk to your provider about what their plans are because they've got them. Evacuations. Make sure that you know what to do and make sure that you don't leave my buddy using a wheelchair up there on the third floor trying to figure out how what he's going to do. Lots of times folks will say, well, bring the folks, you know, with mobility disabilities out on the stair landing and have them wait for firefighters. I'm not too sure how, how good I feel about that. 
Just saying. But have a place to meet near your business and outside of the immediate area because near your business could be a, a very dangerous area. So we talk about a communication plan. And what is that? Well, like you've heard prior, it's the people that care about you. <laughs> they wanna know that you're okay. These are the folks that should be uh, part of your communication team. These are the folks where you uh, would designate one, two, three to be an out of town emergency contact, which means everybody's contacting this person rather than locally because uh, the systems could be jammed um, because everybody's texting everybody within the local environment, which is already going to be overwhelmed. Um, so you're going to need somebody on the outside who's like, yep, yeah, I, I talked to mom, I talked to dad, I talked to Grants, everybody is okay. Because um, otherwise, that's a lot of, of stress trying to figure out what's going on with your family members. Have a meeting place and a timeline. So if I don't hear from you or see you by X hours, X days, what have you, then you know I'm gonna take other steps from that point on. The reason you do that is so everybody at least has an idea of what the other folks are doing. So it's not like, you know, well, I've stayed in this place, I better go and try to find them. And then as soon as you leave that location, they come to find you at that place. So we're trying to avoid all that. I understand I'm going through this fairly quickly, uh, but I really uh, hope that you will take advantage of the websites that I'm putting in the presentation. Next slide, please. So of course, what we just did, drop cover, hold on once things start moving and shaking. Uh, and if you're using a walker or a wheelchair, it's lock cover and hold on, and it's covering the back of your head and neck to make sure uh, that it mitigates um, uh, the impact of anything falling down on top of it. And I can't emphasize this enough because a lot of people, you know, are in the doorways, that whole thing, don't go in the doorways, you'll get your fingers pinched, crushed. It's really not as structurally sound as we used to think. Um, and it's been amazing to me about like how many people actually don't know to drop cover and hold on. Having come from blizzard country now, you know, <laughs> that's, so one of the first things I learned. So afterwards, check for those gas and water leaks, all right? The broken electrical wiring, sewage line, stuff that's gonna be dangerous, okay? Don't go to it, just put eyes on it and make sure that you can try to protect people from, from going to it. Uh, don't try to relight gas pilots, okay? Like, let the professionals take care of that. Um, we're not going to need any more uh, reasons for explosions. <laughs> and be prepared for aftershocks. Uh, sometimes they can be more powerful than the earthquake. And certainly, um, after you've been through a shaker, the last thing you need is to uh, have your face and the ground underneath your feet rocked anymore. And to emphasize, uh, the business aspect, please visit some of these websites like the LA County Economic Development Corporation, where they'll have um, templates and plans and assistance to uh, continue your, your business. And I'm sorry, I guess I, I flew through this a lot quicker than I thought. Um, so your local resources are, of course, I'll have to put a pitch in for uh, the Emergency Management Department, um, the LA County Economic Development Corporation, BICEP, which I'm sure, or at least I hope you're familiar with, uh, it's out in the valley right there, um, and the Earthquake Country Alliance. These are four places where you can go uh, right now on the web to start the discussion about uh, not only your homes, but you're also your businesses. Uh, and again, the emphasis, uh, emphasis being that businesses and organizations are made up of uh, individuals. Another uh, thing that I have to pitch is Ready Your LA Neighborhood. 
So it's an emergency plan that the emergency management department can help you develop. Uh, you can do it yourself with some assistance or we can um, uh, kind of get our hands in there and do it almost quote for you. Uh, I don't like using that phrase, but uh, it's, it's the only phrase I know <laughs> at this point. And the concept is united we stand prior to the event, but divided if we're not on the same sheet of music, we will fall. Um, and that identifies threats to your neighborhood, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, to your business and how to address them, what the resources are, okay? Um, even on an on a, uh, organizational level, um, for example, uh, as I was a medic in the army, uh, then somebody might say, hey, I know that this guy, he was a medic in the army, um, you know, he could be a resource. I'll raise my hand and say, yeah, I could run the triage section or something. Um, <clears throat> you also might have uh, organizations that um, have resources that you may need or that you may be able to provide. So it's a plan to literally bring the neighborhood together almost in a way that we, we don't see until emergencies happen. We're gonna to try to do it prior. Um, and it also identifies who's most vulnerable in your neighborhood. Um, elders, folks with disabilities, people who are monolingual, maybe we don't speak the language. Um, uh, one of the examples that I've heard uh, and the work of folks with disabilities and others with access and functional needs is the uh, single mom who speaks a fairly um, unknown dialect of a foreign language who's now here in LA. So this individual is going to be vulnerable simply because of the, the lack of information uh, in his or her language. Um, so those are some of the things to look out for not only individually, again, but especially in your organization. Because organizations really are the backbone of, of communities in a lot of ways, it's people are going to be going and looking to these organizations uh, for leadership and uh, uh, a path to resilience. And you'll see in the bottom, although I guess I didn't, <laughs> there's two colors there, the Ryland video. If you go to YouTube and you put in Rylan, emergency preparedness, uh, you will come up with a video put on by uh, my department and explaining exactly what we do under Rylan and um, how we can be of assistance. So I certainly am encouraging you to uh, go check out that video and um, stay in touch with us. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. So many helpful and very practical suggestions. I mean, somebody noted in the chat, dollar bills. <laughs> Hadn't thought about it, but you make a really good point. And so many other things that we need to keep in mind for emergencies and, and for resources. So um, also, one of the um, Economic Alliance staff reminded me that um, the Alliance itself has built, has, has a resilience guide. Um, and so please be sure to, to contact the staff. I, I am a, a resilience guide, and I'm, a, I'm assuming that's for businesses in particular, but I'm sure there's relevance to the individuals as well. So um, feel free to contact them, reach out to the staff and ask for that guide if that would be helpful. And certainly um, the, the resources that Rick and Louie and uh, Joanne had mentioned as well. So um, I think they put it in the chat, but um, today, the, the PowerPoints and, and uh, talking points that they have provided for us will be available through the Alliance on their website. So um, we want to thank you again to all of our speakers. I think Joanne had to leave. But now I'd like to open it up in case there are any questions or comments um, from those in our group. I would just like to apologize for not actually sharing my PowerPoint this whole time. <laughs> oh, that's okay, Rick. Well, if we can see it later, that'd be great. <laughs> So my boss will be so proud, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it was very, very helpful. So any questions or comments from uh, from those on, on the call today? Yeah. Oh, yes, Kelvin. 
I like the fact that you approach this from a military perspective. I worked with the Marine Corps for nine years. When I heard you say same sheet of music, it, it was something that I heard echoed in a number of different debriefs. Honoré Russell wrote a book about his experience after Katrina. And one thing he said, which I did not have any visibility on, was that people were asked to leave and then finally people were demanded to leave, but many people could not leave because that quake occurred at a time when most people were waiting for their checks. Mm -hmm. So there were people, because it ended at the end of the month, mm -hmm. they were bound to that mailbox. Mm -hmm. And that's another consideration in terms of what time of day and what day these occurrences occur. Personally, my soapbox is Assembly Bill 2178. And I've been working on a plan to have emergency actions by local businesses, especially food generating businesses, in the time of an emergency. So like if you're on a plane and you say, yes, you'll volunteer to sit next to the exit. If you have a restaurant and you're near where this triage area might actually be established, when the lights go out, when the fire starts, when the methane gas pipe breaks, you are funded to do what you promised you were going to do. And I think that um, that's that's a consideration which at some point I'd love to discuss, but um, this is great. Uh, thank you for having this, having this uh, particular webinar today. Thank you, Kelvin. Have you brought that particular bill to the attention of VICA, Valley Industry and Commerce Association? Because I know they take positions on many issues like that. And uh, that actually, no, I haven't. Put that in the chat and I will send it their way. Okay. Um, VICA.com. Um, Stuart uh, Waldman is their CEO, but they have a, you can look on their website and, uh, and figure out which staff and whatever, but it could very well be that they, they typically will evaluate um, pieces of legislation and take a position on you know things and so on. So they would, would consider it if that's something that, and it sounds like it would be something that would be of interest to them because it specifically engages the business community, which they give a lot of focus to. So uh, thank you for sharing that. That's great. All right. Uh, any other comments or questions? Oh, I see Donna. Hello, yeah. Donna. I, hello. How are you? Good. I also want to thank you for mentioning the CERT program. I think that that's a very underutilized uh, program uh, for those. Uh, it's Certified Emergency Response Team. And um, I know that, um, of course, we do housing, but we do self-help housing, which has um, uh, special hours given towards people's um, uh, down payment. So people only pay $100. But we actually give hours for participation in CERT so that we have more people in our neighborhoods who are CERT trained. Because if we can infuse more and more people into our neighborhoods who have the certified emergency response team training, mm -hmm. we can really create more enriched neighborhoods. And if that can be part of neighborhood council's mission mm -hmm. and more and more nonprofits mission to have cert training among their staff as well, mm -hmm. it can be part of what readiness that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's an excellent point. And I think uh, Donna alluded, uh, rather Joanne alluded to this earlier that, you know, we'd all like to think that we can rely on the fire department and, you know, emergency services. The fact is they're going to be overloaded. So the more people that we have trained and ready to respond immediately uh, with whatever skill level they have, um, you know, that would be, it would be really helpful in the big scheme as, as Rick pointed out, we need to be united, you know, and, and functioning as neighborhoods and, and so on if there is an emergency. So uh, yeah, thank you. That's great. Any other comments, questions? Uh, Dennis, yes. Oh, Dennis, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, a question for Louie. Thank you for the presentation, all three of you. But um, you, know, you mentioned that it takes six months or more in order to find a cybersecurity threat has affected you. <laughs> it's a pretty sad commentary. Um, some of the um, 
I guess, observability search and security software systems like Elastic or Datadog or New Relic, are any of those uh, being used by you or um, companies that you work with in order to uh, spot the problem um, almost in real time in order to deal with your response to uh, take corrective action? Thank you, Dennis. That's an excellent <clears throat> question. Um, we don't use those particular softwares, but we do use similar softwares. So Dennis is referring to um, cybersecurity software uh, to, to detect threats and to observe behavior. Um, we use one, Dennis, it's called Huntress. Um, and Huntress is, is very similar to the systems that you mentioned. What it does is it moves beyond uh, typical antivirus to look at behavior. So if something, if files are being accessed at three in the morning, that's typically not normal behavior for an organization. So Huntress would alert the IT team and by way of the IT team, you know, the executive management that, hey, something's going on here, this doesn't look right. Uh, depending on the severity, it can be notified. So yes, there's, uh, there, there, we're using softwares like that. And the ones you mentioned, I'm sure they're wonderful as well. Um, but I think the thing to keep in mind is that no matter how many of these systems that we have, we always have to attempt to stay ahead of the curve. Um, and there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no way that we can say that we're absolutely uh, taken care of. That, based on that slide, you can see with Sony Pictures and, and uh, Home Depot and, you know, LAUSD and all these organizations. So yeah, that was a, but, but softwares like the, those are, are, are very helpful to detect threats. And, and because hackers will often go to the lowest, uh, you know, uh, lowest hanging fruit organizations that aren't using these, they're going to go there first, as opposed to the organizations that have everything locked down as much as possible. Right. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for that yeah. question, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you, Louie. I see that Zedar, my friend Zedar has a question or a comment. Um, unmute and join us. Hello. Okay. I have actually two items. One, uh, listening to you said, I'm assuming that you're saying that the cloud is fairly secure for use. I don't use it. I've always thought that it wasn't. Hmm. So yeah, and I saw your question in the chat as well. That's an excellent question with respect to the cloud. Uh, we could talk for hours on that, but I won't. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it concise. The, the first question is, what is the cloud? The cloud is uh, essentially someone else's computer, right? So when we store, if I were to store uh, data on a little flash drive like this, that's like me holding the data in my hand. Or if I'm using it on my laptop, which I'm hitting right now, right in front of me, that's my data there. If I'm storing my data on the cloud, what that means is I'm using someone else's computer. So for example, dropbox.com is a reputable organization. Microsoft, OneDrive, that's reputable. Um, Amazon AWS, that's reputable. And if you really zoom out a lot, you know, we are, I, I use, I'm not going to tell you what bank I use for security reasons, but I use one of the big banks we've all heard of. Their data is, it, is stored on their systems, which may or may not be on Microsoft or Amazon web services, which are all reputable organizations. So whether I like it or not, I'm using the cloud by using one of these big banks that is reputable, they're, they're probably doing all the right things and they're, so the cloud is essentially someone else's computer. There's pros and cons of both, uh, but the, the big pro that I like is that if I'm using Microsoft OneDrive or Dropbox.com, those organizations are putting millions of dollars strictly to keep that data secure. Um, and so it's a, it's a very valid debate, you know, they're a bigger target on their back, but, they're also putting millions of dollars to keep it secure. So it's a it's a noble argument both ways, but we do like to use those reputable companies for the cloud. Thanks for that question. Okay, one, one other item, and that is uh, just the other day looking, and you mentioned banks. Uh, my bank sent me information uh, based on uh, Equiflax, I think it was, that uh, one of my email addresses was found on the dark web. How do you, wh where do you go from there when that happens? <laughs> really? e excellent question. Uh, and that's, that's a question that impacts everyone on this call. So when you go from there, and as I mentioned in my presentation, how can that happen? Well, if I use target.com, right? My wife and I shop on target.com. My email address is on there. My password's on there. If target got hacked, which target did get hacked, 
And then my email address will be on the dark web. I mean, everyone on this call, I hate to say it, probably 95% of us are our email addresses on the dark web just with UZDAR. Uh, so uh, the question is, it's just a matter of time, right? Because we work with all these different companies. What do we, where do we go from there? The, what we do from there is we make sure that we change our passwords on all of our uh, organizations that we use that are critical first. For example, the banks, whether it's Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase Bank, uh, you know, if we have special uh, software that has our information on it, like even Home Depot, right? They have my credit card in there, so I probably want to change, uh, I want to change passwords for everything like that. And then going back to my presentation, we want to make sure that we're not using the same password like, you know, Louis123, I don't want to use that same password on Home Depot, Target, you know, we want to have a unique password free. So to answer your question, we'd want to change our passwords on the critical systems. Great, great questions. Thank you, Zidar. Uh, we may have time for one more question and answer. Anybody else like to make or comment? Uh, anyone else like to uh, engage? I don't see anybody at the moment, but thank you so much. I think there were some excellent uh, questions raised, points made. And once again, thank you so much to, uh, to Louis and to Rick and of course Donna now in absentia. Um, for really very, very informative uh, presentations today. Excellent reminders in some cases like, oh yeah, I meant to do that, but I've kind of let it go. So um, so good to have those, those reminders of, of things that we should be doing um, to protect ourselves as well as our businesses, our families, our nonprofits. Thank you, Rick, for really highlighting the important work that nonprofits are doing and, and will do in the case of an emergency. Um, so uh, sometimes that's kind of forgotten, but they're out there on the front lines typically when, when a disaster strikes. So um, thanks all of you for joining us. Again, we had a number of guests today. We're glad that you've come and we hope that you'll join us again next month for our uh, next Livable and Sustainable Communities Committee. Uh, take care, everyone. <laughs>